Theresienstadt, 1943-1944 As the days and months passed, Theresienstadt became more crowded and cramped. New trainloads of people arrived all the time. This meant that there was less food for everyone, and people became weak and sick. The oldest and youngest people were most at risk. One day, after she had been in the ghetto for a year, Hannah received a message from her brother. Meet me at the boy's house at six in the evening. I have a wonderful surprise for you. George couldn't wait to share the good news. Grandmother is here. She arrived last night. The children were overjoyed at the thought of seeing their grandmother. They were also worried. George and Hannah's grandmother had been a refined woman who lived a cultured, comfortable life in the capital city of Prague. It was this generous grandmother who had given them their scooters. When they visited her in the big city, she always gave them bananas and oranges. But in recent years, she had been quite ill. How would she manage in this awful place? Not well, it turned out. The children found her in an overcrowded attic with only straw to sleep on, one of many old, sick people. It was the middle of July, and the attic was boiling hot. They were horrified by what they saw. Their gentle, elegant grandmother looked terrible. Her beautiful white hair, always perfectly combed in the past, was a mess. Her clothes were torn and soiled. I've brought you one of my paintings. Hannah exclaimed, thinking it might put a smile on the old woman's face. But her grandmother could barely turn her head. Instead, Hannah folded the coarse paper and made her painting into a fan. Rest, she told her grandmother as she tried to create a cooling breeze. Hannah felt proud to be caring for her grandmother. Hannah soon learned that old people in Theresienstadt were given the smallest and worst rations. The food her grandmother got just wasn't enough and was often crawling with bugs. And there was no medicine. The children visited as often as they could and tried to cheer her up, bringing crafts they'd made and singing songs they'd learned. This bad time will all be over soon, George told her. Mother and father are counting on us all to stay strong, Hannah said. But in three months' time, their grandmother was dead. Beyond Hannah and George, few people took much notice. Death was all around them. In fact, so many people were dying so fast, the cemetery was full. Clinging to each other, Hannah and George tried to remember the happy times with their grandmother and cried together. As more people poured into Terezin, Thousands more poured out. They were crammed into boxcars and sent eastward to an unknown fate. Rumors about the transport spread inside of the walls of Theresienstadt. Some tried to convince themselves and others that a better life awaited the people who were sent away on the trains. But as time went on, stories of death camps, brutality, and mass murder circulated widely. When people spoke of these things, Hannah covered her ears. Every few weeks, the dreaded lists would be posted in each building. People whose names were on them had to report to an assembly hall close to the railway station within two days. Lists. Everywhere there were lists. The Nazis were systematic record keepers, and they wanted all their prisoners to know it. Through the constant counting and listing of people, the Nazis reminded the inmates who was in charge. Everyone knew that being counted, being noticed, could mean a transport and another separation from family and friends. One morning, as Hannah was doing her chores, everyone in the camp was ordered to stop what they were doing and assemble on a huge field outside the town. Everyone, old and young, they were marched out by Nazi guards carrying machine guns and ordered to stand there with no food, no water, and a sense 
that something terrible was about to happen. Hannah and the other girls didn't even dare to whisper among themselves. Hannah couldn't bear the thought that she might be separated from George, or from the girls in Kinderheim L410, who had become almost like sisters. Wasn't it enough that her parents had been taken away from her? Ella stood beside her and tried to cheer her up with smiles and winks. But after four hours of standing, Hannah could no longer contain her despair. She began to cry. Ella slipped her a tiny piece of bread she had hidden in her coat. Eat this, Hannah, she quietly implored. You will feel better. But Hannah's tears kept coming. The big girl then turned to her. Listen carefully to me, she whispered. You are unhappy and scared. That's just how the Nazis want to see us, all of us. You can't give them the satisfaction, Hannah. You can't give them what they want. We are stronger and better than that. You must dry up those tears, Hannah, and put on a brave face. Miraculously, Hannah did. The Nazi commander began shouting out names. Everyone had to be accounted for. Finally, after eight hours of standing in a bitter wind, everyone was ordered to march back to the barracks. It was September, 1944. When the Nazis began to realize that they were losing the war, they announced that more people would be leaving Theresienstadt. The transports were sped up. Now a new list of names went up every day. Each morning, her heart hammering, Hannah ran down to the main entrance of the building where the list was posted. And one day, there it was. The name she dreaded finding. George Brady. Hannah's knees buckled. She sat down on the ground and cried. George, her beloved brother, her protector, was being sent away to the east. That wiry boy, now a young man, was told to report to the trains along with 2,000 other able-bodied men. At their last meeting on the dirt path between the boys' house and Kinderheim L410, George spoke urgently to his sister. I leave tomorrow, he said. Now, more than ever, you must eat as much as you can. You must breathe fresh air at every opportunity. You must take care of your health. Be strong. Here is my last ration. Eat every last crumb. George gave Hannah a huge bear hug and gently pushed the hair out of her eyes. I promised mother and father that I would take care of you and bring you home safely so that we can all be together as a family again. I don't want to break that promise. Then the curfew whistle screamed, and George was gone. Hannah became despondent. First her parents had been taken from her, and now George. She felt so terribly alone in the world. Sometimes when the other girls tried to cheer her up, Hannah turned her face away or even snapped at them. Can't you just leave me alone? Only gentle Ella could convince her to eat her meager rations. Remember what your brother told you. You need to take care of yourself and stay strong for him. Four weeks later, Hannah learned that she too was going east. A reunion? I'll see George again, she told everyone. He's waiting for me. She sought out Ella. Can you help me? She asked. I want to look nice when I see my brother. I want to show him how well I've taken care of myself. Despite her own fears, Ella wanted to nourish the hopes of her young friend. She smiled at Hannah and set to work. She got water at the pump and used her last little square of soap to wash Hannah's face and to clean her knotted, dirty hair. With a piece of rag, she tied Hannah's hair into a ponytail. She pinched Hannah's cheeks to bring up a little red. Ella stood back and looked at the results of her efforts. Hannah's face shone with hope. Thank you, Ella, Hannah said, hugging the bigger girl. 
I don't know what I would do without you. For the first time since George had been sent away, she looked happy. That night, Hannah packed her suitcase. There wasn't much to put in it. A few pieces of pretty worn out clothing, one of her favorite drawings from Friedel's art class, a book of stories that Ella had given her. When she was done, Hannah got into her bunk and slept her last night in Theresienstadt. The next morning, she, Ella, and many of the other girls from Kinderheim L410 were marched out to the railroad track. Nazi guards snarled orders, and their dogs bared their teeth and growled. No one stepped out of line. Where do you think we are going? Hannah whispered to Ella. No one really knew. The girls boarded the darkened rail car one by one until there was not an inch of room left in the train. The air turned sour, and the wheels began to turn. The train chugged on for a day and a night. There was no food. There was no water. There was no toilet. The girls had no idea how long the journey would be. Their throats were parched, their bones ached, their stomachs twitched with hunger. They tried to comfort each other, singing songs of home. Lean on me, Ella said softly, and listen, Hannah. So when I want to cry the blues, I just recall the centipede. Consider walking in her shoes, and then my life seems sweet indeed. The girls held hands. They closed their eyes and tried to imagine being somewhere else. Each girl imagined something different. When Hannah closed her eyes, she saw the strong, smiling face of her brother. And then, suddenly in the middle of the night on October 23, 1944, the wheels of the train ground to a screeching halt. The doors were opened. The girls were ordered out of the boxcar. This was Auschwitz. An angry guard ordered them to stand straight and silent on the platform. He held tight the leash of a large dog, straining to pounce. The guard looked the group up and down quickly. He cracked his whip in the direction of one girl, who had always been embarrassed by how tall she was. You, he said, over there, to the right. He cracked his whip one more time at another of the older girls. You. There too. Then he called over to a group of young soldiers who stood at the edge of the platform. Take them, now, he ordered, pointing to Hannah and the rest of her group. Huge searchlights almost blinded the girls. Leave your suitcases on the platform, the soldiers commanded. Through a wrought iron gate and under the watchful eyes of the surly dogs and uniformed men, Hannah and her old roommates were marched off. Hannah held on tight to Ella's hand. They passed huge barracks, saw the skeleton-like faces of prisoners in their striped uniforms peeking out the doors. They were ordered to enter a large building. The door closed behind them with a frightening bang. <laughs>